very well-known person in beef production at the ARC, Dr. Michiel Skols, joins us today in studio to talk about strategies to support climate smart beef production in South Africa. Please put climate change in context for beef production. Yes, whether we like it or not, climate change is a reality and it's going to have an effect on beef production. Uh, because we are going to get more extreme events, such as droughts, uh, floods, uh, also uh, more heat waves. So the climate is going to be much more variable. Uh, but what will happen uh, in beef cattle is, uh, during periods such as heat stress, uh, their production will be influenced, and that's both the uh, milk production to feed the calf as well as the growth rate of animals, even post weaning. Uh, there's going to be a lower fertility and the fertility of both males and females is going to affect, be affected. So that will result in a lower uh, reproduction rate, uh, lower calving percentages in calves. And we are also going to find more diseases, especially the tick-borne diseases. And I'm going to say more about that later. And lastly, the quality of the grazing is going to decrease because grasses is going to change from C3 to C4 grasses. And that's why we need strategies for climate smart beef production. So, But the bottom line is climate change represents a feedback loop. Uh, livestock contributes to climate change, but also uh, suffer from the consequences of climate change. So we need a, a, a two-way approach. Uh, we need to make sure that our production systems and our beef cattle will be adapted to the changing climate, but we must also reduce uh, the carbon and water footprint uh, to mitigate uh, climate change. And that's why I uh, consider adaptation and mitigation. Uh, whereas in most temperate countries of the Northern Hemisphere, uh, in Europe and in Americas, they looked at mitigation, how to reduce the carbon footprint. Because adaptation is not an issue, because even if the climate uh, changes or the temperature improves, it will just make the environment more suitable for the animals. In our case, if the temperature increases, it makes the environment more unsuitable. Dr. Michiel, so what is the effect of climate change in South Africa? Well, the first effect is going to be we're going to get an increase in temperature of between 1.5 and 2 degrees Celsius in the next 40 years. And it's going to make some areas very uncomfortable or unsuitable. That doesn't sound climate. a lot, but it, it uh, hasn't, but, yes. But it is a lot, yes. yes. Mm. Uh, secondly, there's going to be a moderate decrease in rainfall. The effect on rainfall is not going to be that much, but it's going to decrease. But more importantly, it's going to be much more variable. So you're going to get very wet years and very dry years. Uh, and as I already mentioned, the quality of the grasses is going to uh, decrease. But most importantly, we are going to get an increase in the distribution of a tick-borne disease such as hot water. Um, larger parts of the country will be uh, exposed to the hot water disease. Uh, and uh, heat stress uh, has a direct effect on, on beef cattle. The first thing is heat waves will reduce the feed intake. It will increase water intake in most breeds, so uh, farmers will make, have to make sure there's enough water. Uh, it's going to reduce the growth rate, and we found that heat stress reduced the growth rate by between 9 and 17 percent, depending on the genotype, so it's quite substantial. And uh, as I said, we're going to get a reduced fertility in both males and females. Uh, the male, uh, the period for the male sperm to be for, uh, uh, mature is between six and eight weeks. So if you have a heat stress of two or three days, the fertility of the bull is going to be affected for the next six to eight weeks if the animal is not adapted uh, to heat. And uh, that is why we need climate smart strategies. So what are these strategies? Well, the first one is the utilization of our own indigenous breeds. The second one is we must improve cow-calf efficiency because that can reduce the carbon footprint. We should look at alternative measures of efficiency post-weaning that can also affect the carbon footprint. But we need can also do effective 
crossbreeding because that will uh, uh, increase the adaptation and reduce the carbon footprint. So it actually affects adaptation and mitigation. And the last one, if we can have early warning systems, we can help farmers to adapt or prepare for periods of heat waves. Just elaborate on the adaptation strategies that you uh, referred to, and you also spoke about that in your introduction. Yes, the first one, the first adaptation strategy is the use of our indigenous breeds, and I regard that as our heritage for food security. Firstly, they adapted to the local conditions. They have got very good meat quality, and they can survive and reproduce under the very harsh environments. And this is important in the era of climate change. The second adaptation strategy is the development of early warning systems. If we can have short-term warning systems of 7 to 14 days. Farmers can change the licks or the supplements that they give to the cattle to uh, mitigate the effect of heat stress. What happens with heat stress, the animals, because they're trying to uh, get rid of the heat, they sweat and they exhale more, uh, they lose some of the uh, ionophores and basic minerals. So if we can mix that into licks, we can balance the cation anion uh, balance that can be balanced so the effect of the heat wave will be less if they can receive licks uh, that prepares them for the heat wave. Uh, a medium term heat wave uh, or medium term uh, warning system uh, will be important if we can get uh, indications of droughts. If farmers can be warned in time that the next season is going to be dry. They can reduce the cattle numbers and especially sell the older cows before they get so thin that they, you cannot market or slaughter them anymore. So if they have an early warning system, they can rid, get rid of the unproductive and old cows in time. But I think that's happening already. They are warned, uh, the farmers. Uh, yes, <laughs> the, the problem currently is that our warning systems are not very accurate. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I you mean precise exactly from that time to that uh, time? Or, or whether it's going to be a very severe or not. Right. I, I attended a conference, the National Global Change Conference in January that was held at the University of the Free State uh, by the Department of Science and Innovation and a number of other bodies. And it was indicated there that unfortunately our uh, weather forecasts are not very accurate. One of the reasons for that is uh, load shedding. A lot of the remote weather stations, they lose, uh, data. Weather, they lose data because there's no electricity. So uh, <laughs> it is a big issue. But secondly, if farmers are warned in time, they can make uh, preparations to use alternative feeds, something like boscos which is uh, ignored, but in 2015-16 it was important. If farmers are only time, they can prepare for that. Furthermore, if farmers know that the coming breeding season is going to be have a lot of heat waves and it's going to affect bull fertility, they have two options. Use multiple sire mating, where you put three or four bulls with your cows in the same camp, or use uh, our indigenous adapted uh, breeds will be, will be less affected. So warning systems can play a big role. The one that's a dream that I don't think will uh, materialize if, is if we have early warning systems, vaccines can be prepared in time to make provision for the disease outbreaks that may be linked to higher temperatures or higher uh, uh, moisture due to higher rainfall, but that perhaps that's a dream. Yes, and that's a topic of uh, for another day. <laughs> what are the, uh, the the mitigation strategies you, you refer to? Okay, if we look at the total production cycle in beef cattle, the calf cow part of the production cycle uses seventy two percent of all the energy consumed over the whole period. So, if we can increase cow calf efficiency, we can. Uh, save on the energy utilization because we, we were working on the 72 percent but the factors that influence cow efficiency or cow calf efficiency is firstly the winning weight of the calf because that's the output the second one is the feed intake of the cow 
but in extensive conditions we can't measure that. So we use cow large stock units, which is linked to dry matter intake, to predict the daily feed intake. And the third uh, trait is, of course, fertility. How frequently is a calf produced? So how can we increase weaning weight of calves in relation to cow weight? We are proposing an index that includes cow weight, oh, sorry, calf weight, uh, because that's the output, divided by the cow large stock unit and multiplied by the calving percentage. The advantage of this is if you have the carrying capacity of the farm, you can estimate the kilogram calf produced per hectare. And, and that is quite unique. Uh, and we are really looking uh, to uh, improve or to develop more information around that. The second mit mitigation strategy is selection for alternative measures of efficiency. The traditional uh, measure of efficiency is feed conversion ratio, which is the amount of feed uh, eaten divided by the growth rate. The problem when you select for the index, you don't know what you're changing. Am I changing the feed intake or am I changing the growth rate or am I changing both, but I don't know what I'm changing. So alternative measures of efficiency was developed. The first one is the residual feed intake, which is uh, uh, changed by reducing the feed intake, but keeping the growth rate the same. So the animal grows at the same level with less feed. The second one is the residual daily gain, where the feed intake is remain constant, but the animal grows faster on less feed. And we can combine these two in a selection index. Uh, if we want, if we want, if we know feed is a, a problem, then we select for residual feed intake because it's going to reduce the feed intake, but the growth rate is remaining the same. If there's enough uh, feed, then we select for the residual daily gain because we know uh, we are going to increase the growth rate, but the feed intake is going to stay constant. And uh, residual feed intake animals have shown to produce less methane, and they also eat less than high residual feed intake animals, so you can breed more efficient cows. And these two traits, the cow-calf efficiency and alternative measures of efficiency, both address mitigation because it's going to reduce the kilogram carbon dioxide per kilogram product produced. Wow. Yeah, and you did research on all of this. You also mentioned crossbreeding as a strategy. Now, as far as I know that you are very successful with that strategy already at the ARC. Elaborate yeah, on that. Yeah, yes, I, I think the challenge with crossbreeding is that it should be done correctly. Uh, many crossbreeding programs are not uh, designed properly. Uh, in the developed world, crossbreeding is not that important because they can use the a genetic variation within breeds and select for that to improve the production efficiency. And the contribution of heterosis of crossbreeding in the developed temperate countries is not that big. But in the tropical and subtropical developing countries, crossbreeding can play a very important role because we can combine the adaptation of the indigenous breed with the growth rate of the exotic breed. So we have an animal that still grows, but that has the adaptation. Uh, and in that way, we can increase cow efficiency without uh, any additional herd costs. And I want to mention a few examples that we already obtained from Fall Arts Research Station. The first one is, if we use Brahman bulls on Afrikaner cows, the cow productivity increases by 12%. If we use cement dollar bulls on Afrikaner cows, the cow productivity increases by 15%. Uh, Angus bull on Anguni cow increases the cow productivity by 21%. And if we use F1 Afrikaner cows, crossbred Afrikaner cows, uh, the cow productivity can increase by up to 49%. And perhaps that explains the popularity of the Bonsmara breed because it's wow. is that, that Afrikaner genes uh, in a crossbreed oh. that's fixed as a synthetic breed. Uh, we also found in the case of the Charolais bull on Afrikaner cows, uh, the increase in the meat, uh, the value of the meat increased by 27%. And the animals also consumed 27% less feed from weaning to slaughter. Mm -hmm. So there's a massive saving. You produce more meat at a much cheaper cost. And then lastly, I want to say something about rotational crossbreeding. 
uh, especially for our communal but also our emerging farmers. Uh, and by rotational crossbreeding with indigenous breeds, I mean Afrikaner, Monsmara, and Nguni, and they are ro- cross in a rotational system. The advantage of that is they get uh, some benefits from heterosis uh, of crossbreeding, but they don't lose the adaptation of the animals. And I think we can I- increase the production efficiency of especially our emerging farmers if they do rotational crossbreeding using our indigenous breeds. Thank you. Dr. Michiel, thank you very much for, for uh, sharing all this very valuable information on, uh, on climate, smart beef production in South Africa and the future that we can uh, strive to do in South Africa. Thank you very much. Dr. Michiel Scholes from the Agricultural Research Council and he's uh, at the IRC in Irene at Beef Production.